Good evening and uh, welcome to Look Up Bookstore and Cultural Centre right here in the heart of Amsterdam. I'm sat here looking out uh, at the central station in the middle of the old city and I'm here tonight uh, with Jeff Fountain who is the director of the Human Centre for European Studies and we're here to talk about, uh, I was going to say a great man, we'll discover as the evening goes on, but we're here to talk about uh, Abraham Kuyper. And it's, it's a curious thing that we have uh, here in the middle of, of the Netherlands, we've got uh, a British man uh, and uh, a New Zealander, both who have the Netherlands as our adopted country, uh, but talking about a Dutch Prime Minister. So, so Jeff, can you just tell us a little bit more about this location and Abraham Kuyper? Yeah, there's a, a very paradoxical uh, thing about Abraham Kuyper. Um, he's not very well known at all in Holland. In fact, most people don't even know who he is. Those who do, uh, a small group may admire them, another group would despise him, and even during his life he was a very controversial guy. Um, and in fact today he's much more popular in amongst uh, scholars in North America, uh, in Korea, uh, and in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and I first heard about him 48 years ago, 1972, sitting on a beach in the north of New Zealand. Um, and uh, I was working on a newspaper at the time, and I was there with a doctor who said to me, have you ever heard of Abraham Kuyper? Now, ever since then, I've been fascinated by this man. And where we are right now is actually three or four meters from where he would regularly walk past the corner of this building from his house in Prince Hendrikada 173. We're in Prince Hendrikada 50. And he'd walk across the new bridge out here that uh, we're looking out the window at, and he would go on to his office there, his newspaper office, or he'd go to the new kerk, the, the new church on the dam square, where for a time he was the minister. And so this is his stamping ground. And we're going to discover about this man, um, what was his impact on the Netherlands, and what were some of his key ideas, and why is he relevant today? Yeah, and I think the issue of, of being relevant today is, is hugely interesting. We're, we're filming this uh, on a night where it's uh, been sort of announced, a new president of the United States of America, but, but earlier today I was on YouTube and looking at various different videos and, and actually coming across uh, American Christians who were quoting Abraham Kuyper as an example of how to engage in, in society. And yet, as you mentioned, we're, we're here in this location where Abraham Kuyper would have, would have been walking but his sort of legacy is somewhat forgotten in this, in this particular place. Yeah. Um, by the way, for those of you who, who would love to, to visit us, we would love you to visit us too. We would normally be doing this as a, as a live event with an audience, but we are in the middle of COVID time, so we're, we're sat out kind of distance away from one another and, and just recording it for, for those of you who are following online. Um, but why then, why then sort of not that recognition in the Netherlands? And I suppose even more importantly, what is the legacy of Abraham Kuyper in the Netherlands? Why is he significant to this country? Well, let's ask another why question first. Why are we doing it if the COVID is on? Why are we doing it now? And the reason is tomorrow is November the 8th, exactly 100 years ago when Abraham Kuyper died. And so we had planned to have here in the gallery behind us a photo exhibition called uh, Abraham Kuyper's Amsterdam, uh, then and now. And uh, so, uh, as soon as uh, the lockdown is over, we want to invite people to come. Uh, I've been doing some research on the buildings in the city of Amsterdam that really were the backdrop of his life and ministry in this city. And I've been fascinated by it and discovering all sorts of interesting things. Uh, let me just point out this book here, Geloof in the Brouwerij. That means belief in the Brouwerij. That has to do with the brewery that right behind the port. We are actually here right now. This is where the Amstel River flowed out into the A. Uh, the railway station is here. And our uh, YWAM centre, the port, is here. And right behind that was the biggest brewery in Holland. And it was run by a man who was a, a, a strong believer. And he actually became Kalpa's greatest supporter, enabled him to carry out a lot of his projects because he was a, um, a social entrepreneur. And uh, so discovering things like that, uh, it, it, it helps to bring the city alive. So um, that's what this photo exhibition is about. We won't get so much into that tonight. Yep. But, uh, 
Yeah, no, I think, I think that's fascinating. And for those of you who, who sort of don't know, if you, you're sort of talking about a place called Deport. Uh, Deport is a, is a building uh, owned by an organisation, Youth with a Mission, uh, which is sort of, I suppose, about, about a kilometre yeah, that probably. way, if that means, <laughs> means anything to you who are watching on, online. But uh, it's also sort of right near the sort of admi the centre of the Admiralty in Amsterdam. Yes. This is all the naval area, all here. The port is here. Oh, sorry, the port is here. That was all the naval base, and this is where the brewery was. Yeah, yeah. And this is all shipbuilding area um, in succeeding uh, uh, centuries. So, if we if we move then onto that question, uh, particularly of the legacy in the Netherlands. Why, why is this man significant to the Netherlands? Okay, now I'm going to show you some slides and, and, and tell you some of the story um, as to who this man was and talk about his influence on the Netherlands. And then we talk about his key ideas and then his relevance today. So it was exactly 100 years ago, tomorrow, when, uh, when he passed away. And on the 12th of November, which will be Thursday, it'll be 100 years, since thousands of people lined the streets in The Hague as his funeral went by, and they were taking, um, uh, they were saying farewell to the man that earlier they had voted, actually the most popular Dutchman uh, in the country. And so that's the amazing thing. He's forgotten now. In fact, a, a few years ago, my wife and I were watching a television quiz show, and the question came up, who was this man? His first name was Abraham. He was a prime minister of, New Ze uh, of, of, of the Netherlands. Uh, he was the founder of the Free University and the, uh, the leader of the first political party, the Anti-Revolutionary Party. And there were three well-known Dutch people on this show called the smartest person, the slimster Mance. And they ummed and ahed for I don't know how long until one of them said, Calvin, Calvin, Calvin John Calvin, oh yes. <laughs> it just showed up the ignorance of this. Now, so that's why it's important. What we want to show tonight is why this man ought to be known. If you, if, for Dutch people to understand their own history, they should know about this man, whether or not they're believers. Um, and uh, yeah, as I've said, he's, he's forgotten, even though uh, scholars around the world still study some of his 20,000 articles and 200 books. I've got just a handful of his books here and books written about him, but 20,000 articles. That is more than one article every day for 50 years. Now, that's just incredible. So, uh, this is a man that uh, actually has, has not really been fully studied. Uh, Johan Snell, who's going to be, uh, who's a, uh, a Dutch um, journalist is going to be with us on Wednesday and talk about, in, in Dutch, talk about this book that he's come out with recently, also for the centennial of his death, The Seven Lives of Abraham Kuyper, The Seven Labors for Abraham Kuyper. And uh, he said, we haven't begun to really you know, fathom all that's there. He's actually doing his PhD on, um, on Kuyper's journalism. And uh, so let's go to see, let's see all the different areas that he was involved in. Uh, he established the first modern Dutch political party and was prime minister. I have uh, also here a book, let me show it to you. Uh, this is a book that uh, is talking about the letters between Groen from Prinsler and Abraham Kuyper between 1864 and 1876. This is 12 years of letters. And this correspondence is actually what gave birth to the first modern political party in Holland. That was called the Anti-Revolutionary Party. Anti-Revolutionary meant it was against the humanistic impulse that came out of the French Revolution. And uh, on the one hand, Kuyper in his life, um, he was finding a third way between modernism, on the one hand, that came out of a, an idea that no god, no master, man is his own, um, the captain of his own uh, ship, and on the other hand, conservatism, a hierarchical conservatism with the aristocracy. And he was trying to find a third way that he believed to be a biblical way in between. So, so we're sort of saying, so conservatism with a with a small c, but with yeah. the, the, the traditionalism being really the thing, rather than the kind of conservatism we might now approach today with sort of free market economics. This is about sort of the rule of, of a ruling class that's existed for a long time. Yeah, uh, when you when you think of the the tensions that were going on in Cowper's day, the end of the uh, the second half of the of the nineteenth century, 
you've got, you've got these battles going on, you know, Marx is coming up on the one hand, but then you've got the, the, the kings and the monarchies and the royal and, and the aristocracies trying to hold on to the idea that, well, you know, um, God has set some people above all the others. Whereas what Cowper was doing actually was paving the way for democratic thinking as well. Um, so he also shaped Dutch education. Um, he, he championed multicultural diversities of schools and founded the Free University. Now, actually, the education system that we have here in the Netherlands is quite unique. Yep. And it comes from Abim Kaufman, because he said everybody lives from, out, from a certain worldview. That is your basic understanding of reality and your education will flow from that. There's no such thing as neutral education. And he fought the battle, what was called the Schoolstreet, the school battle, uh, so that parents would be able to send their children to the school that would teach the worldview of the choice of the parents. So that's why we have Catholic schools and Protestant schools and anthroposophical schools and Muslim schools, evangelical schools, uh, secular schools, and different types of schools, and they're all supported by taxation from the government. There's no other country that, as I know of that has anything like that, and that's Calpa. Yeah, and I think this is quite sort of fascinating when you've got this guy who's sort of so revered in the United States as well, where in you really have States, that, yeah. the, oh, in part of the yeah, United States, yeah. but, but among, I suppose, evangelicals in the United States. Uh, um, but then you have this, this concept in the United States where really that's sort of unthinkable, the yeah. idea that the government would fund religious education. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, what you're talking about is a sort of very normal thing for a, for a Dutch person. I mean, I've, I, I, we take I, it for granted. Yeah, we um, take it for granted. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've got my kids, for example, who are in a, an open Barabasa school, which is a secular school. But I, I know that I also have the choice to send them to the Montessori school or to the evangelical school or so on and so forth. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So education. So politics, education, um, in the in the realm of broadcasting. Uh, again, another unique situation in Holland, and it's unique because of Avram Kalpa. We have uh, broadcasting corporations that have grown up around different worldviews, variations of these worldviews. Like in the Christian area, you've got the Catholic, you've got the Protestant, and you've got evangelical, K-R-O, N-C-R-V, uh, and uh, the A-O, the F-E-P-E-R-O was another one that, that came out of the liberal Protestant. Actually, that's what the, where the F-E-P comes from, the Freie Protestants. And uh, then you have all, all others, FARA and uh, BNN and, and TROS and so forth. Now, this is un unparalleled in any other country. Why is it here in Holland? Because of Abraham Kuyper. So that's, um, uh, he's had a huge impact, and yet this is not generally known. Now, uh, here, we, we said he, he could often be seen walking past this building from, the, from his home to cross the bridge here to his office. Um, here's a picture of him <laughs> walking by. And his office, he worked on a newspaper. Now, for, for f over 40 years, he was the editor of this newspaper um, that he wrote most of the articles for anonymously. It didn't come under his name, but everybody knew that... Yep. The standard was Abraham Kaufer, and Abraham Kaufer was the stan standard. And uh, not sorry, I'm pr pronouncing it wrong. Standard, not the yeah. And even when he was prime minister, he was still doing this, and he was recognised by the other journalists as one of the greatest journalists of the country. In fact, he chaired the the Dutch journalist circle uh, for a number of years as well. So in each of these areas, whether we're talking about education, we're talking about uh, politics, uh, we're talking about um, in, in the media, and particularly in the newspaper here, in journalism, uh, he had a career that was top in the country, but it was just one of several careers. And in fact, this is what Johan's going to be talking about, the seven lives of, uh, of Abraham Kuyper. No, but he actually started his career as a minister. Yep. And he was, uh, his first place was a little place called Based, south of, uh, of Utrecht. And that was very interesting. You see, he was a modernist himself. But it was in Base that he was challenged by um, a, a, a little village lady whose name was Peter Baltus. And she refused to go to his services. It, and when he came to visit, she even refused to shake his hand because she didn't think that he was preaching the gospel at all. 
Now, actually, it's a long story, it's, but he, he was just a young man in his 30s, he was greatly impacted by the faith of this woman and knew she had something he didn't have. Yes. And that was actually what triggered his own conversion. Uh, th and ever since then, he was a champion of the little people, the Kleiner Louden, he called them. And uh, so then he went to so Utrecht. So and it's, it's quite a, so yeah, that's, that's a, it's quite a sort of fascinating story. First, first the aspect of sort of a conversion as a minister. Yeah. Um, but it also this, this little people aspect of it, to be uh, the champion of the little people uh, through, I suppose, through the pulpit to begin with. Um, for, for those of you, by the way, who... Um, who haven't done so, it also reminds me a little bit, I, I was watching, Jeff, you, you did an interview uh, with the Schumann Centre some, some weeks ago, uh, also with a, a sort of similar story out of uh, the former East Germany as it came into, uh, as it came into being a unified Germany, of, of the story. 30 years ago, you mean yeah, the, the fall of communism. Yeah, fall yes. of communism. So yeah, the spiritual uprising that happened behind that. Yeah, yeah. the similar stories there of pastors yes. who sort yes. of took this call upon their life to say yeah. actually you know we're, we're preaching the gospel in our church yeah. but actually we, we need to do something in the political sphere yeah. so that's, yeah. it's quite a, an interesting sort of transformation obviously one that, that sticks quite close to your heart and the things you're teaching yeah it was a focal point of an alternative worldview and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about you know what do we build a worldview on later um, but so he went from this little place called base he went to uh, Utrecht and there he was preacher at the big Domkirk in the center of the, 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 the city and then he came to Amsterdam where he was preaching in the new Kirk and um, so here what what he was uh, challenging was a state church that was still a leftover from the Constantine's day where state and church would represent the, the you know the, the, the powers that be and he saw the need for a free church, democratically uh, chosen um, with their elders and so forth, the, the Calvinistic idea. And actually that then led to him leading a, a whole movement, a dissident movement uh, that was called the Doliansi, yeah. um, and uh, gave birth to a whole new denomination called the Geref Mierekeke van the van Nederland, um, or the re-reformed churches, if you like, of the Netherlands. And, uh, that only a few years ago got fused back into what's called the Protestant Churches of the Netherlands. But you know, here, uh, here he is another whole career, and he's actually starting a whole new church denomination. Yeah, and I think this is also a, a thing that seems seems to us sort of strange because we're so used to it. But is this concept that in in generations gone by, sort of you know this pre pre 1800s, the, the idea that uh, nations and churches sort of had to be intertwined. Uh, and if you if you weren't part of the national church, then you were kind of a non-conformist outside of the pale. And uh, of course, that's also a reason that you have all these people who are then going and fleeing to other countries in order yes. to, to yeah. practice their freedom of religion. Yeah. But then you've got this guy who's stepping outside of the state church and yet still being very involved in the state and eventually yeah. becoming prime minister. So and that made him unpopular. It made him unpopular with the royal house, for example. He was never the greatest... Uh, 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 Queen Wilhelmina was not, never his greatest fan, <laughs> although she had to um, uh, um, ask him to set up a cabinet in 1901 when he became prime minister. Um, yeah, and so and that's also why many people uh, criticised him because he was splitting the national unity of the church. Yeah. But what was at stake here was what was the nature of the church? What was the true nature of the church? Yeah. Um, so he was, he was admired by his followers, he was heckled by his opponents, and lampooned by cartoonists. And so here we have a cartoon, a very famous cartoon, by a cartoonist, uh, Albert Hahn. And, but he wasn't the only one. Who, uh, you know, there were, he, he was a, a bit of a Donald Trump sometimes in terms of being a favorite for the cartoonists uh, to take the mickey out of him. And, uh, and there were one of his actual rival editors called him the man with ten heads and a hundred arms. That's yeah. why we've called this whole exhibition and so on, Seven Lives, Ten Heads, A Hundred Arms. What did he mean by that? Uh, this man was so prolific in so many areas, so productive and so influential, 
uh, he was almost impossible to, to oppose. And out of frustration, and yet genuine respect, and there was a genuine uh, friendship on a professional level between uh, Kaupe and other, journal, uh, other editors, but this editor from, actually it was Alkamena Handelsblad, uh, he <laughs> gave him that memorable title of the man with 10 heads and 100 arms. Which I suppose is very understandable if you write 20,000 articles yeah. and also do so many careers. That's right, um, that's right. So, so this, this influential figure, um, I think we, so I'm, I'm looking at one of your slides, which I don't know if it's coming up on the screen, but this influential figure in, in Dutch society. Um, we also need to sort of ask, you know, what, what are the ideas though? Yeah, you know, what, yeah. What's, what's well, behind that? The, the philosophy of life, the theology of life that yeah. leads to that kind of... Uh, yeah adaption of being such a diverse character. Well, before I move off that slide, um, this photo is of the bust of Abraham Kuyper uh, by the aula of the Free University. Now, the Free University calling this the, the Kuyper year, yeah. Be not just because of his um, dying 100 years ago, uh, the Free University was started 140 years ago, this year. And it was, um, it was just a few hundred meters down the Amstel River here, now down the Damrak, to our left, looking out here, uh, in the new church. And that is where Abraham Kuyper in 1880 um, stood there and he said, there is not one square inch. Now, let me see. Does that come up next? No, no. Uh, there's not one square inch of human life where Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say mine. Now, here we get to one of his key ideas. Um, what I'm saying here is that, hey, don't you think we ought to get to know this guy a little bit better to understand this country and understand uh, what has actually shaped this country? So, his key ideas. I'm going to pick out four or five here. The first is the Lordship of Christ over all areas of life. So, this is, here's his quote. There's not one square inch of human life over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say mine. Now, when I first heard that, it was at the time, it was in, the, in New Zealand, at, when I was mentioning before, in 1972, I had gone through a faith struggle at university myself, trying to match my faith with my studies, and my own Baptist church never went into these areas where my faith was, where my studies were taking me. And the more I read about history, the more I saw terrible things done in the name of Jesus in history. But then, as I discovered Cowper, who, who had a comprehensive understanding, yes, he is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. <laughs> and so what does that mean? What does that mean? And so exploring that and exploring where we can see God's hand in history really has been the passion of the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, here's a second idea, common grace. Now, this is actually a, a, a big, thick book that he wrote. Um, that's now, uh, for the first time, being translated into English, coming out of uh, Grand Rapids. Common Grace is, is one of three volumes. Um, and basically the idea here is that God has promised to Noah, when he gave him the rainbow after the flood, that God, he would never wipe out the human race um, until his purposes were fulfilled. And Carpenter was asking, why is it that in a world full of sinful people, why don't things get worse and worse and worse? And very often we think, we, we actually almost convince ourselves that they are getting worse and worse, but that's not true at all. Why do sinful people do good things? Why do people do selfless, uh, selfless acts? Uh, why do uh, sinful fathers actually you know, do good things for their children and so on? And Kaupa, his teaching on common grace helps us to recognize where God is at work in all sorts of ways. He's sustaining creation. Uh, the institutes of government are given actually to keep things in order, to synergize all the elements of society. Um, God has given everybody a conscience, a law written in our heart. And, and even if we haven't been exposed to the Bible, we still, as Paul writes about this, we still know the difference between right and wrong. Um, and also human advances all through the medieval times and, and, and so on, the Renaissance, and up to modern times in medicine and, and education and science and all sorts of areas, 
all of these things have been part of God's common grace. That was tremendously liberating for me to discover this understanding. Yeah, and I think this is a very liberating idea as well when we sort of talk about a, a generation of division. You know, the, the, this concept that online and so on, sort of the world is becoming more polarised. Uh, and, and it seems to be that the idea of common grace gives that capacity then to actually say, well, you know, everybody still has got this sort of uh, something of God within them, and, and so, so, so about institutions and so on, and therefore it's, it's not such a kind of them and us. Uh, yeah. do, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, you see, what we often, I think, those of us who have evangelical backgrounds, we tend to think of them and us, you know, those who are saved and those who are not. Um, whereas Catholics would tend to uh, understand much more the whole family of God being the whole of creation, mm -hmm. uh, the brotherhood of man, well, sisterhood of man, uh, <laughs> brotherhood of humanity, I, uh, yeah, what's the right word? Um, and, and this is, Calvin's understanding was that our, when we look at society, we're not thinking in terms of class competition yep. or aristocracies, um, but we're recognizing human beings are all reflecting something of God's image. Now, the, we need to recognize the image of God uh, in everybody, which is also the source of the, the common grace or the good that comes out. And um, whereas sometimes, especially Calvinists, and, and he was a Calvinist, uh, they tend to emphasize the depravity of yep. man and only the negative side. And we tend to have, therefore, negative views of the future. We expect things to get worse and worse instead of recognizing, well, God hasn't finished with his purposes yet. Yep. So, yeah, those are, um, that's the second key idea is common grace. Uh, was that a third idea? Uh, Christ, Lordship of Christ over all, uh, common grace. Um, actually, I squeezed in another one here, um, and that is, antithesis. I won't say a lot about this, but, but, but very often the books about Cowper will say that the three main ideas are common grace, antithesis, and something called uh, sovereignty in own sphere. Now, antithesis was that basically when somebody is regenerated, becomes uh, in right relationship with God, that will give that person a whole new look on all of life, a new approach to study even. Whereas often, and my, my, the way I grew up was more, well, you know, you have all these neutral areas like mathematics and physics yeah. and chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. No, a counter said, no, everything changes actually. And we need to be renewed, uh, uh, transformed by the renewal of our minds. And so on the one hand, you had this common grace understanding. On the other hand, you had this antithesis yeah. uh, uh, that there is a clear separation and he's not blurring that as, as modernists often do. Uh, he's saying, no, there is a clear separation between light and darkness, between day and night. So that was, a, that was another concept. Um, yeah, so, so, that's, so we, we talk in that terms, and I, and I know sort of in, the, in the late 1800s, it's sort of a relatively common kind of philosophical term to talk about an, antithesis or antithesis. Um, but this is the idea of sort of there can be a, a very clear opposition to things as well. So you can look at things with common grace and say, well, actually, this all stands under common grace, but at the same time, because I suppose of what you mentioned earlier, this, I want Christ to be Lord over all, yeah. yet an individual who's, who's made a commitment to Christ can still sort of stand in opposition to certain things. Is that, yeah. is that a correct yeah. sort of understanding? Yeah. And, and it's, it's reflected in, for example, Calvin's, uh, uh, Augustine's um, book, The City of God. You know, there's yeah. a, a city of God, city of man, um, and uh, there is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And the understanding of Christianity is that um, history is moving in a direction. God is driving that. He's sustaining, um, he is sustaining creation. In fact, uh, he has a book on uh, the, the, how the Holy Spirit is the, is the power behind the sustaining of all creation. All the green plants, uh, yeah. behind that is the Holy Spirit. And um, uh, that... The Holy Spirit is renewing creation, sustaining creation, and moving creation towards the end, which we re read about in Revelation. The kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Now, if there's no antithesis, then, okay, there's no difference. But yes. in actual fact, there is a transformation process. 
And uh, so that is um, wrapped up in this idea of antithesis. Now, um, this, ver this very key idea, sovereignty in own sphere, um, I th think this is best uh, thought about in the terms of the Olympic rings. We all know that familiar symbol, uh, five interconnected rings. Now, in the Olympic uh, symbolism, is that these are the five different continents. But let's apply it now here. Um, so Kalpas saw the different spheres of society as having their own God-given authority. And each of them were accountable to God. There's government in terms of self, self-government, self-discipline. We're accountable, each one of us as individuals, to God. Secondly, families. Family had received its own government from God. Parents had responsibility for children. And uh, there, that was not something that the church ruled over, that the state ruled over, uh, uh, but was directly accountable before God. The church was another area where there's government directly accountable before God. Now, <clears throat> Calpers taught, based on Calvin, that when any one of these authorities moved out of his God-given sphere, it became tyrannical. Yep. Sometimes the church did that in history, became tyrannical. Sometimes the state did that. And a totalitarian state will try to wipe out everything between the self and the state and not have any what's called social midfield, these other rings of the social midfield or civil society or mediating structures. See, these are different terms used. And, but a strong, healthy, flourishing society has strong uh, sense of, of government in each of these areas. Now, church government um, is, is one of these. And this one, the yellow, the voluntary association. Now, what is that? That is where people can um, come together and work together on a covenant basis or a contract basis. Uh, it's a, it can just be a club. It can be a broadcasting association, a newspaper, schools, universities. Um, even <laughs> uh, my, my father-in-law was the pre president of a Protestant goat breeding club. And I said to my wife the other day, I said, now why, he didn't even have breed goats. Why was he president of a Protestant goat breeding club? And she said, because he was Protestant. <laughs> I, I just had to laugh, you know. Uh, sometimes this pillarization got out of hand. But um, this voluntary association, is, uh, that we also need to recognize this whole concept of a social midfield came out of a Christian yeah. concept of society. So, so when you're saying pillarization, again, that's, that's a term that maybe Dutch people are yeah. used to. We haven't really talked um, about that. But, but, but uh, I suppose that also comes back to the whole thing we were saying about schools before, is the, is the, the concept that actually you could have your Protestant school, your Catholic school, and so on. But you're, you're giving yeah. that when you moving into the... I, I realise I skipped over world view. Um, you see, Kalpa would teach your understanding about God yeah. is the starting point of every world view. If you don't believe in God, that will affect your understanding of human identity yes. and how people should relate together. It's up to us to decide. Um, and uh, everything flows out of an understanding of who God is and therefore who, who we are as human beings. Because if there is no God and we are just simply chemical accidents, the product of slime plus time, then who's to say what the rules are for living? Basically, society does. But that's not a Christian understanding. And so our worldview will flow out of that. Now, all these different worldviews, and, and, and here we get into the relevance of Kalpa. Um, he recognized we couldn't ex expect society to be monolithic anymore. It yeah. was becoming pluralistic. And we had to respect what other people believed. We can't just keep burning heretics. We have to respect their standpoint because they, even if they're not believers, something of the image of God is that in that person. So he was working out a, a whole basis of society where these different understandings could operate together in peace and harmony. And the state would see its role as being the referee between these different worldviews. Yeah. Now, out of that came this idea of pillarization. And so Dutch society was set up where, to the extreme, whereby you would have, um, if you were a uh, reformeerd, 
You would not go to a head formed, let alone a Catholic greengrocer, you know. You would read the newspaper from the Kharef Mir, which was the standard. Um, but if you were Catholic, uh, you would only go to Catholic institutions. And in those days, it wasn't quite as pluriform as it is now, but you had your secularists, uh, Catholics, Protestants. Uh, well, within the Protestants, you had the Reformed and the Re-Reformed. Um, you didn't even have any clear evangelical position in those days. So uh, if I sort of look at that, it also feels quite a, an Amsterdam idea. Uh, we've done our, our fair share in Amsterdam of heretic burning and uh, I, I, but when I look out the window I can see a nice hotel standing where they used to drown people and, and, uh, and hang people for, for these things but then there was this transformation in Dutch society of really then stepping into this uh, idea of well we, we, we're going to be rubbing along together so we've got to have these sorts of ideas but then you're saying Kalpa sort of developed that idea further. Yes very much and, and uh, you know a lot of his writings um, we're dealing with how do we uh, pursue justice yep. for everybody? Uh, how do we pursue freedom for everybody, freedom of religion? Uh, because so long as the church was attached with the rulers, see, that they were imposing only one kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, faith. And uh, how do we live in a multi-cultural uh, world? And that, that's why he was way ahead of his time, in a sense. Um, and this concept of worldview, therefore, led, in his understanding, to uh, pillarization. Now, here's where we come to some of the negative side, too, because uh, taking that idea, some of Kalpa's followers developed it in South Africa into apartheid, saying, oh, we should be all separate, you see. And so then he got tired with that brush. Uh, whether that's very, really fair um, is a point that scholars have been debating. Um, but you can see how that can be misused. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sort of aware of a little bit, um, teaching a little bit of uh, Amsterdam history as well. How, how there's been the accusation that because uh, of the pillar system as well, Jewish people sort of fitted into a particular pillar as well, and therefore it actually became easier as well when, when the Netherlands was invaded and came under Nazi control, that actually that they would be, be rounded up. And so uh, I've certainly heard that accusation that this is in part, the pillar system meant the sort of higher numbers of deportations from the Netherlands compared to some other places. Probably, a, probably quite, <laughs> there's a lot of other things that contributed too. Well, I know yes. that that's a criticism that the, there. Yeah, but there's a balancing thing. You see, there is this pillar system, but sphere sovereignty also came with a balancing concept of sphere uh, universality. Okay. And we see in the Olympic rings here, they're all interconnected. And for society to flourish, these spheres must interconnect. Now, okay, there was a recognition given of the distinction of the Jewish population. Yep. But there wasn't the fact that they were allowed their distinctiveness. It was the fact that the lack of solidarity when push came to serve and the churches did not stand up enough. There were significant individuals and significant churches that, that really did oppose uh, the, 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 the Nazi persecution of the Jews. But here you, we need to think about also um, the solidarity aspect and uh, that uh, the, well, I sh the sphere university, I'm using a Catholic term when I say solidarity, yeah, uh, sphere universality, the recognition that all these spheres, actually there's an ecology of life, yeah. you can't just separate, we don't live our lives in these separate sections. They all actually um, are interconnected and uh, uh, we, we need to be careful. Um, separating them too much. And this is what happened with this pillarization. People lived only in their own bubble. It became okay. bubbles. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I might ask you a couple more sort of difficult questions on that, uh, that sort of historical aspect of the negative aspects of, yeah. of, of Cowper as well. Um, but I, I know we also want to talk about his, his relevance for today. This isn't just something from the, the past, but actually, uh, I suppose the reason that we want to do this tonight is we actually we want to really say Here's a guy that we've got things that we can learn from. Good lessons, as well as bad, definitely good lessons. What for you is, is the particular sort of 2020 relevance of us going, well, you know, this guy died 100 years ago. Yeah. Why talk about him tonight? You know, why, yeah. not, why not just allow him to be forgotten? What, what's, yeah. the, what's the importance of him today? Yeah, I think here we see some of the differences between um, the general attitude of those who know who he is um, in, in Holland and um, those more in the English-speaking world uh, in Holland, he's often seen just as a man of history. Okay. 
Whereas in the English-speaking world, he's been discovered more recently as a man of ideas, and that these ideas were new to the English-speaking world and new to my world, but it's something that the, was old hat to the Dutch. They grew up within communi- uh, Cal- uh, Calvinism, and Calvin had uh, more, much more than Martin Luther, a much more comprehensive understanding of the implications of the gospel, of the kingdom of God, for all areas of life. And that's what made Geneva a model that strongly influenced the forms of government, including democracy, um, in Holland. William uh, Willem van Aronje was strongly influenced by these ideas from Geneva. Uh, in England, in Scotland, with John Knox, and going across to America with the Pilgrim Fathers and the, and the, and the Puritans and so on. Um, and so uh, the uh, Holland had really been influenced by these ideas, but um, Calvinists were not generally the strongest ones in other parts of uh, the English-speaking world. And it's only been more recently that there's been a discovery of the relevance of this man's ideas. Um, but because 1920, when Cowper, uh, when Cowper died, represented a kind of beginning of a time where uh, you know you had a first world war you had depression you had Hitler, a second world war and the cold war etc etc um, the church withdrew yep. uh, and especially evangelicals that uh, um, withdrew from the social area even though um, we haven't really touched on Cowper's contribution in the social area and taking up uh, the concern for the poor people uh, and starting the first um, Christian Social Congress in 1891, which still goes on, actually, that Congress. And out of that came ideas. How do we respond to the negative side of the Industrial Revolution? Um, and, but we withdrew from all of that area. And for actually up until, uh, you won't remember it, but I do, uh, around the 70s, uh, was, a, was a turning point for evangelicals to wake up to the fact that actually the gospel has profound social implications. But if you talked about that in the 50s and the 60s, you were considered to be a modernist, and yeah. your, your faith was, uh, was brought into, into question. But it wasn't until people like John Stott and Billy Graham and the Lausanne movement began to wake up the evangelical movement to recognize we've been blind to a whole dimension. And then came the discovery of people like um, uh, uh, Abraham Kauper, um, here's a book called Evangelicals in the Public Square um, that looks at people, Carl, uh, Carl Henry, Abraham Carter, Francis Schaeffer, and a guy named Yoda. Yoda. Uh, some of the leading people began to, to uh, encourage this revival of, of awareness of the two-handed gospel. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, knowing a little bit about church history, of the, the idea that really you know, the social gospel got very much connected in with yeah. kind of the, the liberal view on the historicity and so on of, of the Bible, um, it's, it seems there that, 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 that Kelp has sort of not fallen into that trap but has really actually appreciated the fact that there must be an implication. And one of the things I'm thinking about with this history is if, if you sort of talk about this aspect of care for people who are um, poorer, I know that also, you know, we're, we're, again, we're right by Central Station and I know there were strikers at Central Station and Kelper, uh broke up the strikes. Yeah. So, so you've got this sort of interesting, what we might see as a sort of dichotomy between this guy who's saying, let's look after poor people, let's reform the factory system and so on, but also let's stand against, against the strikers. Now that, that often seems interesting. I suppose the, the other movement I would identify since the 70s is the kind of the rise of the, uh, the religious right as well. So often we sort of see this um, uh, hand in hand aspect, whether it's rightly or wrongly portrayed, that it seems quite often that the religious viewpoint is the one that sort of goes along with the factory owner rather than the factory worker. Um, does uh, does Kalpa have much to say in that, that sphere? Of Very things? much. You see, uh, what, what was also interesting was that Kalpa was beginning to come out with a social thinking and he wrote a whole program called Ons Program, our program, uh, how we should deal with the, with the inequities of the Industrial Revolution. At the same time that Catholics, now let me see, um, Pope Leo XIII was, was laying down principles for the Catholic Church to respond to the Industrial Revolution as well. It's the principles of Catholic social thinking. Now this book has been put out recently 
by Acton Institute that was primarily a Catholic initiative, um, makers of modern Christian thought. And it's about Leo XIII and Abraham Kuyper. And the Catholic social thinking started with the image of God in every human being, and therefore out of that uh, you had the dignity and the sanctity of life, and therefore you, 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 uh, you sought for the common good of the whole. You didn't just think, well, I'm going to come up for my own sort of people, and fight for Christians. You know, no, the common good of the whole. And, and then, so this concept of solidarity came out of Catholic social thinking. That played a very key role uh, in the solidarity movement in Poland. That was uh, really the key for the end of communism there. Uh, and then there was an associated thought called subsidiarity. That is, it's wrong for the top levels to steal the responsibility of the bottom levels. It should be pushed down. So it should not be centralized. Now, so Catholic social thinking was kind of vertical in a sense. You know, it was okay. aware of the hierarchy of society. At the same time, Cowper came along with his concept of sphere sovereignty that was much more egalitarian and, and horizontal. Now, so Cowper is providing, and here's part of his relevance for today, Cowper is providing a way for Catholics and Protestants to dialogue about how Christians should be involved in the social questions. And this book and the work of the, uh, of the Acton Institute does a lot of that. Um, go on. I mean, it, feels, it feels like some of these ideas are really sort of tying together. So we've got the, the working for the common good, which of course makes sense if you've got this idea of, of common grace. Um, one of the things, other things I'm sort of fascinated in is, is when you mention this, uh, how for coming from a viewpoint that was saying we want to work for the social good, but we don't necessarily want to do it for a, for a hierarchical structure. Today, you know, again, we're, we're on a sort of day where an election's been announced. It often seems that the sort of the drive for one side or the other side is for power over the other. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm really kind of fascinated then about yeah. how sphere sovereignty stands against that. How do you sort of stand against this idea that you know Jesus is Lord of all, but at the same time I'm not taking power by being sort of at the top of the chain? Yeah. All right. I want to come back to your strike the, across okay. the road here by the railway station. Cowper was not against strikes. He promoted the right for the workers to have trade unions. He promoted the first trade unions, and trade unions is one of the things he said they have a right to have. But um, it's, the role of government was justice. And there's no political bl blueprint in the Bible. Never, it doesn't, it's not, just doesn't say what you should do in a particular situation. There are principles there that stem from the character of God. And he had to think, what is the right thing to do in these circumstances? Now, he wasn't perfect at all. Um, in fact, he was an aggravating person to be around at times, and sometimes he aggravated his closest friends. You know? uh, and, but he was really at the forefront of the form formation of trade unions, and he formed a government together with the Catholics um, against the liberals, in order to, to fight for the common good, particularly of the, of the workers. So that was a comment I wanted to make. Um, so coming so back to it, well, yeah. When you say the liberals, uh, well, liberal that, that's not in the way we'd understand it today. Is that, that liberal in terms of a liberal economic theory and kind of being more open to markets? Well, no, well, what, what does that mean in that Yeah, time? the li liberals were the, those who had espoused the values of the French Enlightenment, uh, okay. uh, the human beings. Uh, uh, the, we're, all, we're totally free to uh, choose what lifestyle we have. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. um, the aspect of sphere sovereignty and um, uh, how does that relate to hierarchies? Um, yeah. The, the, uh, as I said, the, the Catholic understanding of social uh, thinking tended to you know, follow the hierarchy of the Catholic Church itself, um, whereas Kalpa brought in a much more egalitarian approach and, and recognizing these different spheres in society that had to be respected. Now, I have a friend named Sander Lautwiler who did a lot of work on this concerning how do we apply Kalpa's thinking to the European Union? Okay. Because really it had only been applied in a national, national situation, but not a supranational situation. And here he showed how complementary these two ideas were. The European Union has embraced some of these ideas of Catholic social thinking, subsidiarity and solidarity are two strong EU words, and it's come from Catholic social thinking. And what Sander was trying to point out was, 
uh, was actually the, 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 uh, the contribution that Cowper's thinking could make as we're in this project that's an unprecedented um, experiment, yep. that uh, it's, it's, it's just a work in progress. What has this got to contribute to as, as we try to think of the kind of Europe that God might want? So these are all parts of the, the relevance of, of Cowper for today. Um, we're still wrestling with this whole question, how do we live in a pluralistic society? And as Christians, we think, well, everybody should come to see the, the way, uh, see things the way we see things. That's not realistic, and that's actually not respecting freedom of choice in the other people. God gives people free choice. He doesn't force them to believe in himself. Now, that doesn't mean he gives them the freedom of choice as to what the consequences will be, sure. but he gives them free choices. Erasmus, a long time ago, he was saying the church should not be burning heretics because of the, the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, the owner said, no, wait until the judgment day. Don't cut it down now, you see. So Carpenter would, would reserve the judgment on that. And he would say everybody has rights, certain rights, and, and w the role of government is to ensure justice and peace and freedom yep. and solidarity. Um, and so that, at, at times that might mean having to be hard cracking down on workers uh, in a strike. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, Robert Schuman from the European Union was forced for the same thing when he was Prime Minister of France. Yeah. I, well, I, I, don't, I don't want to divert you sort of too much away, because I, I think there's some other things you'd like to say about, about Calpus' relevance for today. Uh, I also think it, it's, you know, it's bold talking to, about the European Union uh, with a British person at this moment in time. Uh, we're still, still trying to work out our relationship with the European Union. But one of the other things that, I, that strikes me as interesting in this is also just this question then of uh, a lot of our clashes in this modern era are, are coming over issues that maybe might fit in that circle that's kind of written down as family. Yeah. And that circle that's written down as government. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back uh, to I, that. I just kind of wonder on that one, sort of where would Cowper have seen, uh, sorry, it's, it's not government, it's state. Where would Cowper have seen that kind of, I see there's a crossover in the Olympic rings, but where would Cowper have seen that limit to the state's power over family uh, as, as, as stopping, really? Because I think that's yeah. a big... Yeah. issue today. Yeah, uh, that is a big issue today. And you see, Cowper's thinking gives us a framework for asking those very kind of questions and responding to them. Uh, where are the limits? Yeah. And uh, um, that's where we, my tradition as evangelical is really just the top line, those three circles on the top. We talked about self, we talked about uh, you know, discipleship, we talked about family, we talked about church. We didn't know how to talk about the kingdom and voluntary association. We didn't really know how to talk about the kingdom and state. And this is what I think Cowper can offer us today, a way of an approach to start thinking. And I want to come back to the thing about Britain and, 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 and uh, the EU and how Cowper can help us even in there. Um, uh, and so that very question that you just raised is, OK, how do the bottom line relate to the top line yeah. here? And, and, and he would say here, OK, uh, we've got to recognize um, uh, that the, the state does have a certain role in intervening into institutions where things are really failing badly and there's no other way it can be pulled back. But that's the last resort. Um, by and large, he, would, uh, he was not a liberal in the sense of everything should be fair, laissez-faire, no government involvement and so forth. Neither was he social saying the government should be involved in everything. Um, and it was truly third way. Okay. And, um, but I want to come back to, uh, I think that the question of, of, of Cowper's thinking and the EU and Britain right now, um, he, Cowper's thinking can offer a real framework for thinking, how, where does Britain go from now? And in fact, two days' time, on Monday, we're going to be having uh, an interview with Jonathan Chaplin, um, who is a, an Englishman married to a Dutch woman. And he has edited a book called uh, Brexit Britain, or the future of Brexit Britain, and asking these very questions. What will be, within a Calparian framework, the responsibility of the British people and Christians in Britain in their relationship to Europe and Europe's responsibility to Britain and so on? How should they still relate? Um, because w if we think of the nation state as the end goal, yeah. we're not, we never talk about how those nation states should relate together. But as in Psalm 133 it says, 
Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. What is God's purpose is for nations dwelling together in unity? Okay. So uh, th this will be a question we'll be pursuing actually on, uh, um, on, on Monday. And Jonathan Chaplin is actually, he's written a lot about, um, about I've got, I, I know there's a book here that, that he's contributed to concerning Cowper. He's, uh, he's been looking at, at uh, Cowper's thinking in terms of uh, how can it guide us in our current situations. And there's another area where uh, we could see that Cowper could uh, guide us, and that is the renewal of democracy. Democracy is under attack. We're seeing it, uh, you know, we can't believe what's happening in America. You know, democracy is in a gra grave danger of moving towards autocracy and, and anarchy and so on. Uh, even, you know, some of the developments have taken place in England and in Britain, and two nations that the world has admired for their strong democracies, but now on the, uh, the index of, of democracy around the world, they, they're, they're going down, uh, yeah. down the scale. And how do we recover that again? And I think uh, there are different scholars who are exploring what Cowper has to offer to that question. So uh, understanding the, the sort of ideology there as well, it's also interesting to me that I did, I did say brave to talk to a British person about, about Brexit, <laughs> yeah. but as a British person who, who, who's sort of aware of... You mean a, a Brit from the 52% or a Brit from the 48%? <laughs> I, 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 no, no comment uh, about which, which percent I was. Uh, I, of those I, that voted, I, anyway. I, could, I can let people guess based on where I live. Um, but um, the, the very common sort of view, I suppose, in Britain uh, among, um, among those who would, who would have been in the 52% the was, you know, let a nation be a nation, and let's forget these multi sort of international organisations and multinational organisations and so on. Um, although when I mention that, obviously, you know, multinational businesses and so on are not going anywhere, and still uh, Britain's now having to face up to how do we stand up to these as a smaller entity. But what would then Cowper have to say into that question, particularly when he was Prime Minister, of how do you relate to, to other nations? I mean, I know he was, he was pretty, pretty shocked that there was this sort of aspect of shock that certainly lived over his last years at, at the rising up of the First World War, shocked to sort of see that happen in his generation. What, what does he have to say into that then, that, that whole concept of how should we relate to, to nations? You mentioned something about the Psalms and a brotherhood. Yeah, yeah. There. Is yeah. there anything else that we can sort of well, grab from him? Well, he, he was tangentially um, uh, touching on the subject. He, he, he offered to intervene or to mediate between the British and the Boers in South Africa because the Boers were actually descended from, from Holland, uh, from the Dutch, and um, although his offer was turned down by the British, but, um, uh, and he, he wrote considerably, uh, in fact, uh, there's a, a couple of books here, this is uh, around the old world sea, in other words, around the Mediterranean, when he stopped being prime minister, uh, 1905, he went on a, on a tour okay. and, and he wrote uh, two volumes of this and a lot about Islam and so on. So he, he actually wrote a lot of travel commentary and out of that, you know, it was comments on other nations. But I don't know um, what, I don't think that that was an area he pursued a lot in terms of the, the supranational institutions that e evolved, for example, out of the, the Second World War. Of yep. course, the, uh, um, uh, the um, <laughs> what was it called after the First League World of War? League of Nations, yeah. Uh, he would have been around and he, he would have been thinking about this thing, but I don't know, I can't recall anything that would actually answer that question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Um, are, were there other things that you were really thinking we, you know, we should know when it came to that whole issue of relevance for today of, of Kalpa? Well, okay, um, basically I had the meaning of the gospel uh, for daily life. Um, it's... Uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer was uh, the name of a person who strongly influenced my generation too, and in a sense he was a bridge between Cowper and my generation uh, in helping us to recognize the relevance of the gospel for all spheres of life. But he was really very much standing on Cowper's shoulders. So R Cowper was, uh, uh, I think we could say he was the father of Christian worldview thinking. In Youth with a Mission we talk about these life spheres and so on, and, and Lauren Cunningham talks about, you know, uh, a moment in 19... Uh, Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Youth for the Mission, talks about a moment in 1975 where he felt, you know, God was speaking to him about these different, uh, what he called in those days, mind molders. Uh, we tend to call them life spheres now. Um, but more as a target for evangelism. 
Um, but this is a simple form, in a sense, of, of Cowper's thinking. And I was actually doubtful about my relationship with YM at the time. Uh, what, is it really a, a movement that I, I could fit into? Because I'd been influenced by Cowper's thinking. When I heard Lauren speaking like that, I thought, oh, maybe YM is more than just a Bible-bashing outfit trying to save souls. And However, we're still struggling with that, and that's why I think we, we, uh, we, we need to become much more familiar with what Kappa was all on about. Uh, for example, this so book here. Jeff, just to, just to sort of put this in context for people as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, now, directing the Schumann Centre, but, but also historically, you're a director for YWAM in, in Europe, for Youth with a Mission Europe, missionary organisation working across Europe. Yes, So for that's, that's years. the sort of context yeah. that, that we're going into there. Yeah, yeah. And, Here's a good starting point, the lectures in Calvinism. Um, these were actually five lectures, five or six lectures that he gave in uh, 1898 in Princeton University. And this is where he points out how what he calls Calvinism is really biblical Christian worldview. Yep. We often, I grew up kind of thinking, oh, Calvinism, that's predestination. No, no, that's a, a caricature of Calvinism. Um, it was really the, the logic of Christ over all areas of life. That's a real classic, um, and he was uh, in the cover of the, uh, on, on the front page of the New York Times and so on. Um, oh. It made a real big splash in America. And then this little book here uh, by Richard Mao, who was the uh, principal of um, uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. Yep. Um, this is his own personal introduction to Abraham Kappa. It's not very long, uh, and he's saying why we should take Kappa seriously. Now this is t more, you know, the more the North American perspective than you, than you get generally in Holland, but um, I think what Johan Snell is going to give us, uh, only in Dutch unfortunately, on, thir on Wednesday, um, will be also an equally uh, insightful yep. perspective on these men with these seven lines. Okay. You, you, you've also brilliantly answered a question that came in uh, during, during the, the chat, which was, you know, which books would you recommend to learn more about Cowper? So, it's, so it is this one by Richard, Richard Mao, Abraham Cowper, a short personal introduction uh, yeah. for, for English speakers, and we've got Johan Snell for, for Dutch speakers. And uh, as, as a quick plug here, of course, people can, if they're in Amsterdam, they can buy, buy some of these in, in Look Up. Um, before we kind of get to, to an end, I also just have a sort of personal fascination a little bit we're doing something right now which is, um, would not have been done 10 years ago, and I don't think we would, we would not have done this sort of prior to, to COVID. We're, we're putting <laughs> ourselves online That's right. That's as, uh, as a kind of media maker. And I think it's one of the other things that, that fascinates me about, about Cowper in this particular generation as well, is this aspect, you know, we're, we're living in the generation where uh, different sides are saying, well, you're fake news, you're biased media, you know, and so on. They, fact-checking and things like that. Um, seems to me, and uh, you can tell me if I've got this, this sort of summary wrong, but when we talk about pillarization, um, but also we've got this guy who actually, I think we'd probably be, be a bit scared today if we had somebody who was prime minister and running one of the big daily newspapers yeah, in the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, it, I think you said to- Well, we, well we've, had a, we've had a president who daily tweeted and, and discipled a lot of people in that nation, you know, through his yep. tweets. Now, uh, a few hundred meters down the road here, this is what Carpo did for 20 years in that building. He was writing these articles that really discipled the nations, explaining what the Lordship of Christ means in all these different areas of life. So, yeah, for, you know, for better or for worse, it's a medium that we need to be able to uh, yeah. exploit. Yeah. But, there, but there seems to be this aspect in Cowper where uh, one of the things I think worries me today is the aspect that whichever side of the political spectrum you're on, you seem to sort of say, well, you know, the other guys are effectively the evil guys who are giving out the yeah. bad message. Yeah. Uh, would, I, would I be right in, in sort of saying that, that Cowper sort of said, well, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let sections of the media be the media, I don't need to attack them, but at the same time I'm also going to become the media and put out my own message very clearly and professionally and so on. Is, is that, is that a, a good summary or...? Well, yes, I mean, he, he did engage uh, really in strong dialogue with other okay. newspapers as well. Uh, yeah, he, he was a formidable opponent. Okay. And he was actually called Abraham the Terrible, <laughs> Abraham the Gewaldige. And okay. that's why we get this. I don't know if you can see this on the... Uh, <laughs> that cartoon there was uh, Abraham the Gewaldige, Abraham the Terrible. Uh, he wasn't quite as... 
formidable as that. I mean, when you, when you see a, a picture like this, it's a much more uh, fatherly, grandfatherly person. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was quite surprised, having only, only, only seen the cartoons before I saw the photos, <laughs> to realise that he didn't look quite, quite as, yeah. uh, as stern in real life. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if, if you would sort of just, as we kind of draw it into a close, summarise by, if you could say, you know, three takeaways. What should this generation have as three takeaways? L learn this from Cowper or, or because of Cowper study this and, and get into it. Yeah. What, what would your, your top three well, takeaways be? Well, firstly, we need to understand, indeed, what does it mean when we talk about Christ being Lord over all of life? And that involves understanding what worldview thinking is. And as Richard Mao would say, he talks about not so much worldview thinking, but worldviewing. It's the way you live. Yeah. And uh, so that's one aspect. Uh, another aspect is as we engage with society and what we call uh, the public square, um, evangelicals in the public square, uh, we need to be enlightened by the scriptures to know how to engage. Now, this requires public theology. A lot of theology has systematic theology, and that really deals with those top a lot of theology deals with those top circles, but public theology deals with the bottom circles. Yes, what so does the reality of God mean uh, in, the, in those areas of life? And that's where we don't have enough input. Yeah. Um, so, so what we're yeah. sort of saying is, is, is in, in terms of what gets taught, what gets seen, both by, I suppose, the average congregation member, but also by pastors in seminaries and so on, is the theology of family, the theology yeah. of, of church, the theology of the self, that they there's less teaching on the theology of, of the state than the theology of... Yeah, you of see, we think oh, somebody situations. studying theology wants to be a pastor. Yeah. We need to study theology to be a journalist. We need to study theology to be a, 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 a politician. Uh, we need to study theology to be an academic. This is... Uh, to, or to be uh, engaged in, in, in relief services. We need to understand how do we approach these areas. Now, this is still a great blind spot for evangelicals um, to recover and understand thinking biblically about all these other areas yep. as well. So that's a, that would be a second. Um, and then, you know, we need to be able to le re learn to read the newspapers in the light of God's word. And John Stott used to call that double listening. Yep. Uh, listening to God's word, listening to the world, as it were. Now, as I've walked around and uh, thought around the, the city of um, uh, the buildings, what buildings here represent Abraham Kalpa, um, uh, his life in the ministry? I realized, wow, there's actually a lot. And some I've, I've, I've discovered, like, there's still this building here that's right now the Clayner Comedy. It's a theater. Yep. But it used to be the Scottish Mission. It used to say on the top there, preach the gospel to all creatures. This is actually where the university started. That was the very first lectures. They had five professors, and they had eight students. Um, and so then... Often I go back past this building in the tram and I bring my grandson home on Fridays and this, this is the, the, the standard. This is the newspaper office. It wasn't the first newspaper office. It was only at the end of his career. But all of the other offices were just a few hundred meters from us over the uh, bridge here. Um, and there's a whole story behind how Carper shaped the nation through his writings there. This is our building. Uh, and it, it reminds me of um, Aki Kappa walked past here often, and as he would have seen the railway station being built, the Victoria Hotel there being built, the St. Nicholas Church over here being built, and he would have seen this building that used to be three different buildings being shaped into one building. This was all part of the Amsterdam that was changing in his world. Uh, the new church, uh, the new care, not only did he preach there that famous statement, there's not one square inch, this is also, there was an incident there where uh, after the, this movement had to separate from the church, they actually broke into the consistory and, uh, because they felt like they had just as much right to their church. This was their church as well. There, there are a lot of, a lot of stories about around this, this, uh, the buildings in the, in the city. I don't have time to tell here. Um, but I'm curious to you, when we do have um, the, the, the exhibition here, come in, you can read about it. Each one of these has a, has a more explanation. Uh, but the most important thing is to understand, well, so what? You know, well, what does that mean for us today? And I think the most important thing is to recognize that Jesus is Lord over all of life. 
And more than ever before, we need to be able to bring that message, flesh it out in every sphere of life. Yeah, yeah well, I, I mean, I, I love the I love the message. I love the fact that sort of, you know, two of these, these areas is actually also driving back to the Bible to actually get back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? The double listening. I think it's a great, great message. And I also know that, the, you know, a couple of uh, little promos in there. Uh, we're currently in the Netherlands on a... a I think it's sort of called like a, a, a strict partial lockdown, which means our, our shops are open, but our exhibition spaces are not. So we, we, we're intending to start the exhibition today, but we've got to wait an, another 10 days or so to actually start the exhibition. But if you're in Amsterdam, then it would be great if you actually came to, to view this exhibition. This is one small part of it, and this map then, then uh, relates to various other uh, aspects of the exhibition. Uh, if you're interested when you hear about Jeff talking about things like relief efforts, we also, I know I've got in the spring coming up some talks about uh, the Bible and slavery, both in a, a historical context, but also in a what do we do today, uh, the issue of human trafficking, which is a, a live issue. Um, so a couple of plugs there. For, for Firstly, if, if you want to uh, come, and, come and visit us in this location, then in about 10 days' time we'll be... Uh, open for, for that. If you want to get the books, we'll be open for that on Monday. And um, also, if you're interested in, in, in the Bible and other aspects of, of life, we've got these other talks coming up in, in the springtime. But, but Jeff, I just want to say thank you so much for, for talking to us today. Been um, yeah. yeah, it's been, been really fascinating. Uh, I've, I've, I've learned a whole bunch that I just didn't know about, about Cowper before. Um, I, I feel like I'd have to do another talk at some point about you know, the live issue today of burnout and work, work-life balance, because I've got no idea how, how he managed, yeah. managed well, to do so much without a burnout. You know, he burned out. Okay. And he was away for a couple of years, which is when he started writing things like this. <laughs> and, uh, he had to go to Switzerland and Nice and, and you know, uh, to recover. So that's when he became a mountain climber. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, that's another but, life. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a, writing books is a slightly different definition of a burnout than the one I'm used yeah. to. But, you know, obviously a guy with, uh, with a lot of energy, even just hearing about him tonight, today, I feel, feel kind of uh, exhausted by the process, process of thinking about all these places he was walking to. But I, I want to, yeah, just really uh, thank you for, for talking to us about it. I know you're looking forward to, to Wednesday as well, and uh, I know you, we're getting the exhibition set up. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for joining us tonight, Jeff, and uh, if you are watching, uh, I presume at home or on a train, wherever, in a, I think we might have somebody watching in an airport, so if you're watching in an airport, uh, big, big hello to you. Yeah, that's um, especially for Ji Young. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Ji Young, uh, hope you catch, catch the plane and weren't distracted by us. Um, Can I say one thing? If you're interested in this talk on Monday, are talking about yep. after uh, the future of, of Brexit Britain with Johnson Chaplin, go to youtube.com and look for Schumann Talks. youtube.com, look for Schumann Talks, and it's at six o'clock in the evening. Six o'clock in the evening, okay? Okay, great. And uh, yeah, if you go on the Schumann Talks, you can also see the ones I was referring to earlier about pastors who are getting involved in uh, the, the reconstruction of Germany yeah, after yeah. the fall of the wall. Uh, That's the same address. youtube.com. Schumann Talks. Yeah. Okay, cool. So thank you very much everybody for, for joining us. Thanks to the, the tech crew for uh, allowing this to happen. And uh, you never know, we might at some point in the uh, hopefully not too distant future be able to do another one of these uh, in person. Uh, yeah, but and drop by and see the great range of books here if you're in the neighbourhood. Prince Hendrikada 50, opposite the railway station. Good night. <laughs>